I was totally terrified to go to Japan. Uh, I remember I was in the MTC on our last day and me and my companion were both like so worried about what would happen next. But uh, we got to the airport, everything was safe. My cousin was actually there to pick me up at the airport because he was in the same mission. And um, it was raining a lot. So we all like wheeled our our luggage in in the rain and we were so jet lagged and out of it but just um it was so cool because I remember just having such a desire to serve like I don't care that I'm sick I was very sick at the same time as well and that didn't matter to me I was just way excited because I was there on the Lord's errand and it didn't matter what was happening to me <laughs> so my first day with my trainer we actually opened an area for sisters so there were no investigators there at all we didn't even have an apartment so we had to stay with another sister's apartment and we would just ride the train to our area every day for the first couple weeks and so the first day I remember planning with my companion the night before and I said okay what do we do tomorrow and she said we dendo which is a Japanese word for proselyte or do missionary work so I remember feeling irritated like well I know we do like we're missionaries of course we're gonna go proselyte but like what kinds of things did we knew because I had no idea and um the First day we ended up, actually a member picked us up and took us around to visit less actives and some investigators she had found. She was an incredible member missionary and helped a ton with the work. The Tokyo mission has a lot of people. And actually there's, it depends on the area which you serve. When you serve in like downtown Tokyo, it is, I don't know numbers for the number of people there, but um, tons of people. Anywhere you go, you'll see people and they have no space so they can't build out, they build up. So lots of tall buildings, lots of people in those tall buildings. And then when you get out to the countryside, then there's a lot of old people, <laughs> um, not as many people on the streets. It's kind of slower paced. It goes up as north as Niigata, the Niigata prefecture. And there's an island, actually Sado Island, is in our mission now. And then south it is in Tokyo, which Tokyo itself is huge and so it's hard to define exactly, but um, the city of Tokyo, of course, is included in the mission. There's a temple in Tokyo and the missionaries get to go there every transfer. Once. So once a transfer, mm -hmm. that's on P-Day. The Tokyo mission has so many different kinds of people. So officially there's an English ward one, two. There's two English wards and a Brazilian branch. So they speak Portuguese there and then Japanese. But if you know like Tagalog, that will definitely come in handy. Nepalese, that would come in handy. <laughs> Towards the end, it was around 250 missionaries. How many elders and sisters? Oh, over 80 sisters. I know they're over 80. Maybe it's up to like 100 now. <laughs> But about halfway, halfway point of my mission is like 80 sisters. When I first got there, then like all the sisters knew all the other sisters, but then sisters started coming and then I started not knowing all of their names because <laughs> there were so many of them. When I got my mission call, my bishop, he looked at me and he said, do you like rice? And I said, no, I don't like rice. And he said, do you like fish? It's like, no. He's like, do you want to die? Like, <laughs> no. So I learned pretty fast to like fish and rice because I didn't really have an option. Um, J Japanese food, I feel like, is really different than American food. And now that I'm back, I feel like I don't know what American food is. But they eat a lot of fish, a lot of rice, um, a lot of vegetables, a lot of... Um, Do they eat weird food? Yeah, oh, yeah. Of course. They eat octopus, they eat squid, um, <laughs> they eat, they eat this, um, it's like fermented soybeans, it's called natto, and it comes in like a styrofoam container and you have to like stir it up and so it's all slimy. Mm -hmm. At the beginning of my mission, there were probably usually only two missionaries per apartment, but since um, missionaries started coming, in swarms of people then. Um, there's usually four sisters to an apartment, I think. You sleep on the floor, on a futon, you don't have a bed, um, 
And if they're really old stones, it's not very comfortable. But if they're new ones, they're way comfy. I would probably prefer that more than a bed. <laughs> the Japanese people are so kind and they're very polite. And a huge part of their culture is saving face. So even if they totally don't understand what you're saying, they'll be like, oh, your Japanese is so good. So I feel like the more compliments I got, the more I knew I needed to work on my Japanese. <laughs> but they're so nice and they'll do anything for you. We, we had so many instances where we were lost or um, we didn't know <laughs> what the signs meant because we couldn't read kanji and people would go out of their way to help us and they would drop everything they were doing to make sure that we are we were okay and so they're such a giving such a caring community they give a lot of gifts and expect nothing in return and that was a huge part of their culture um surprisingly i didn't feel like i had a lot of culture shock when i first went to japan and i think it's because i expected it to be so different that it wasn't as different as I thought it would be. Coming back to America after the mission has been a lot more of a culture shock to me, but that might just depend on the person. So usually, I, and this isn't the rule for all missionaries, but usually we would try and set up appointments like at the church or something, but I have heard other people, it's a matter of opinion, I've heard other people say like, no, absolutely get in their home if you can. If not, then try and do lessons in a member's home or something. So when you first walk in the door, there's something called a genkan. And it's like a first step and it's lower than the other, like the main floor of the house. So there's just a little step right there. And you go in there and you have to take off your shoes and you can't step back in the genkan before you walk on the first step. And so you take off your shoes and you have to be wearing socks or nylons or something. Don't be barefooted. And then you turn your shoes around so they're facing the door. But while you do all of this, you can't turn your back to the host who's in the house. So sometimes that was kind of hard. <laughs> we didn't eat with the members a whole lot. Like some missionaries eat with members every meal. That was definitely not the case for us. But when members did feed us, they usually fed us way too much. We're like, oh no, we're good, we're full. And they're like, oh, you have another, st they have a thing called betsubara, which means you have another stomach for like dessert or something. So even when you're full, they'll feed you more. And usually we would cook at home. You have an hour every day. Um, but like in one area, we lived in a huge area. And the trains didn't come through very often. And so if we left, it would take way too much time to go back just for dinner. So we'd usually eat at like a 7-Eleven or a store around there. 7-Elevens have safe food. It's not quite like 7-Elevens in America. <laughs> they have fresh food. They are so clean. Japan is such a clean country. Um, one of the things that I thought was so funny is that it's really hard to find garbage cans in Japan. Like you just don't see garbage cans, but there's no garbage on the street. So um, you have to take your garbage with you and throw it away at home eventually. Water is fine. You can drink water from a tap and it's okay. There aren't a lot of drinking fountains in Japan, but they have vending machines everywhere. Just on the side of the road, like anywhere you can find a vending machine. For groceries, it depends on your companion and you can work this out with your companion, but um, with me, usually when we had an apartment with four sisters, then we would just like switch off with the other sisters who would buy groceries one week and who would buy the other week. But sometimes sisters don't like the food you choose, so they can buy their own food. But um, shopping tips, make sure you buy fruits and vegetables, um, which are kind of expensive in Japan, but it's worth it. You need to stay healthy and you need the vitamins and minerals that vegetables and fruits will give you. Don't spend your money on junk food it's not good for you yeah. usually we would just go to the grocery store um, sometimes by the train stations then they'll sell fresh produce grown locally if it's like during the summer or if like peaches are in season and then it's really good to buy those there um, you ride bikes every day um, if you're trans it's if you're going like long distances then you take the train usually but um other than that, you ride a bike every day. Some days we don't ride the train at all. Some days, like in one area I lived in, we lived kind of far from the mission home. And so it would take like three or four hours to get to the mission home and we'd have to go there for conferences, stuff. But that was probably the longest I ever had to be on the train. 
like three or four hours. Learning the language was really hard for me, um, but it was definitely good. It was definitely a good experience. Um, I remember my first couple of transfers in the field, just having days where I thought, why did I not get called to an English speaking mission? This language is ridiculous. But I realized if God wanted me to be fluent in Japanese in a few weeks, then he would let me be fluent in Japanese in a couple weeks. But I had so much more to learn than just Japanese through that process. And I learned a lot about how to learn, learn a lot about patience, a lot about humility through learning Japanese, <laughs> a lot about like perseverance and effort through learning the language. And um, Japanese became, um, it turned from a burden to a blessing. And it was a huge um, blessing in my life to be able to have the freedom to speak Japanese with those I worked with. About six months into it, I became a trainer. Maybe it was less than that. It was on my fourth transfer, I became a trainer, so I had to at least pretend I knew how to speak the language. And I think just like being forced to speak it and forced to pretend I understand it helped me to distinguish when a sentence ends or like to clarify what people are saying. So make sure your skirts are long enough to ride a bike in and give you enough space to ride a bike in because sometimes girls will wear like pencil skirts it doesn't work with riding a bike um i think yeah that was the main thing i was worried about and shopping for clothes for my mission how am i gonna find skirts that will that i can ride a bike in and it was kind of hard to find but i feel like in japan clothes were pretty easy to find i thought clothes would be really expensive or like i wouldn't be able to find anything in my size in japan but it was it was pretty, they had like cheap stores, they had cute clothes in Japan. So if you can't find everything in America, it's okay. You can buy clothes in Japan. Summers are very, very hot and very, very humid. Uh, winters are very, very cold. <laughs> like you walk outside and you feel like you have a brain freeze just from being outside. And then in the summer, like you put makeup on and then you walk out and 10 minutes later, like it has, it's all gone. <laughs> In my first area, we just barely opened the area for sisters, so we had no investigators. We didn't know the ward members at all, and it was just a very new experience for me and my companion, because she wasn't serving there before. Obviously, we opened it, um, but there was one um, girl. She came to something that's called a Kaiwa. It's something that the missionaries teach every week. They teach people English. And so she was coming to that every week and we um, got talking with her more and the elders had invited her to church a couple weeks before we met her um, because she was interested in like being a preschool teacher. They're like, oh, she can help with the primary kids. So she went to church and had a really good experience. And so the week after we got to the area, then we had general conference, so we were trying to invite everyone to general conference, and we invited her uh, to come with us, and she came, and even though she had other plans, she spent all day there. And we talked to her after, like, how was it? She's like, that was so hard. I didn't understand anything that they were talking about. And we're like, oh, we felt like such bad missionaries because we didn't explain anything. But um, as we got talking with her more, we realized that even though it was hard for her to understand everything, she felt um, God's love so strongly. And as we got talking with her, we felt like we should invite her to get baptized. And she said, yes, like, please teach me how I can get baptized. And as we worked with her, it wasn't always easy. She was really busy and she had work, but she progressed so quickly. And her desire to learn was incredible. Um, she worked in a bar and so we thought we'd have like a lot of problems teaching her the word of wisdom but as soon as we taught it she's like i hate alcohol i've seen how bad it is and i i don't want to have anything to do with alcohol and just all these lessons we had with her were so incredible and um we found out she was actually going to move to australia on a working holiday and so we didn't know if she'd be able to get baptized but um we actually talked with her and arranged for her to get baptized the week before she moved. And so she was able to be baptized and receive the gift of the Holy Ghost before she left for Australia.
in my second area, there was this man named Nicholas Santiago, and he was not Japanese, but he was from the Philippines. And we actually met him one day close to a train station. We were just handing out flyers to advertise for our English class. And um, as I was handing out flyers, I felt like we weren't finding anyone. I felt like we weren't using time effectively. And I just had all these doubts in my head. And I realized like something's got to change. I can't keep working like this. And so I said a prayer in my heart. I said, Heavenly Father, just please guide me to find someone that needs to hear from you. Um, and right after that, it's one of those crazy answers in your prayers experiences. But right after that, I turned around and there's a man sitting down at a bench nearby. And we're not supposed to do missionary work to men, but we can hand them flyers. And so um, I went and I was like, do you speak English? And he's like, a little bit. And he totally, he spoke perfect English, which was also a crazy miracle for me because I was struggling with Japanese at that time. But um, he, like I asked him a simple question, do you speak English? But two minutes later we were talking about the plan of salvation and he realized that that's something he was missing in his life. And he had been to so many other churches and he had been baptized members of other churches and he was really seeking for truth. And so we asked if we could meet with him again and he said, no, I have work until way late. Um, which is very true for a lot of people from the Philippines. They work crazy hours and they literally have no time to meet with the missionaries. And so we exchanged numbers and we tried to set up another appointment, but he wasn't down for that. So I tried calling him a couple days later and it was the same thing. He's like, oh, I actually um, was just on the internet looking up about Joseph Smith. And we're like, oh no, the internet has all this anti stuff about Joseph Smith. But he's like, no, 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 don't worry. I'm just looking at the good stuff. And so we tried to set up an appointment with him, but he said, no, I have work. I can't meet with you. And so we're like, well, I don't know what to do. So next week it was P day. And um, at the end of P day, we had an appointment with one of our investigators. And so we went to the train station to meet her and we kept waiting and waiting and she wasn't showing up. We called her. She didn't answer the phone. We didn't know what to do. We hadn't bought our groceries for the day yet because it was P-Day. We're like, there's a grocery store right here. We can just buy it here and then take them on the train back home. And so we walked in the grocery store. And right as we walk in, we found Nick, the man that we had been trying to contact. And he's like, well, hello, sisters. And we're like, hello, <laughs> how where have you been? And just jokingly, he's like, yeah, maybe we can talk again sometime. We're like, no, really, let's talk about this. And he's like, okay, tomorrow? We're like, we can meet you tomorrow. He's like, okay, I don't have time, but like 15 minutes. We're like, that's totally fine. We'll take anything. So we met him the next day and he said he only had 15 minutes, but later he wanted to stay. And we ended up talking for like 45 minutes about um, the restoration and um, just every lesson we had, it was I feel like it was through miraculous means that we were able to even meet with him, just like how we went in the grocery store because our other investigator didn't come. And we were able to meet him another time. He thought we had set up an appointment for a different day, but he just happened to be at the train station the same time we were, and we were able to meet again. There were so many situations with him where it was such a cool miracle. And it was incredible to see his desire to get baptized. He really knew the, internal, the eternal importance of baptism and his family was very opposed to him being baptized. And we weren't allowed to let him get baptized without permission from his wife. And that was a huge trial for him because he knew how important it was, but his wife didn't understand how important it was. And it was so cool to see him fight for it. Um, our ward mission leader told him, he's like, you cannot get baptized unless you have permission from your wife. And he's like, I don't care. I'm getting baptized no matter what she says. <laughs> but um, he ended up not getting baptized on the day that he had initially initially planned to be baptized. Um, but we realized after, like, God had such a bigger plan for him than just baptism. He wanted him to have an eternal family. And that would require him not to be baptized on the day that he was scheduled to be baptized. And so because he said no and he didn't get baptized on that day, it kind of opened his wife's heart and... She was able to trust him more and they were able to build a better relationship 
baptized to the point where she said it was okay and she gave him permission to get baptized and he got baptized like a month after that. So um, it was incredible to see how much he needed the gospel and how much he appreciated it. And then after that, he shared it with all of his friends. He would like give them the pamphlets that we give <laughs> them. And then when they wouldn't read it, he would follow up. He was a way good missionary. And when they wouldn't read it, he's like, you've got to read the pamphlets. These are angels from Heavenly Father and you do not want to waste their time. You do not want to waste your time. This is the truth and you need it. And he testified with so much power. It was incredible to see him grow and progress. Mm. When he was confirmed, then they promised that someday his family would be able to be sealed to him, which I thought was way cool. His daughter has come to church a couple of times and she really liked church. And so maybe we're hoping if the daughter can um, join them, maybe that can be the key to unlocking the heart of his wife. Probably since the time you opened your mission call, you felt a lot, you've heard a lot of different things from different people um, that have been to Tokyo or heard of missionaries from Tokyo. But, um, Take all the expectations you have about Japan and throw them completely out the window because um, serving the Lord in Japan is so different than anything you've ever expected. Um, I remember one night I was thinking, like, missionary work isn't what I expected it to be. And that's a good thing because the Lord sees so much more than we do. And in our finite expectations we limit ourselves to the blessings that god can give us but embrace everything in japan and embrace the culture embrace the food even if it's weird um and just love the people so much because they care about you so much and um know that god is definitely working on the hearts of the people in japan i've seen it and i know that they are so prepared to receive the gospel so throw all the old expectations out the window and just um, trust in the Lord because he's working on the hearts of those people.